Yesterday morning, about nine of us had a wonderful men's breakfast at Robin May's. Thank you again, Robin May. Coral and Les helped as well. Who got to do the washing up? Oh. <laughs> Rob, I think, was on that. Yes. Oh, I got out of it. Oh, amen, brother. Yes. Wonderful time. Thanks, guys, for supporting May and Coral. Oh, May and Coral. Yes. Thank you, Coral. Yes. Um, great time. Uh, we have monthly men's breakfasts and at Macca's or at Rob's. <laughs> so, it's been, so if you can be part of that, it's a great time of sharing and fellowship and prayer together and it's good. So thank you for coming along. But thank you, Robin May, for opening your home to us and we look forward to sharing with you again. It's Job week five. As we come and open his word. Let me just pray before we do that together. Lord God, this morning as we continue to consider your words, Lord God, from the book of Job, and as we consider all he suffered, all he persevered with, and the different people that came and, and spoke into his life, Lord God, I pray that you indeed uh, walk with us amongst times of pain and suffering. When things look hopeless, Lord, you bring the hope. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So today a young man appears. My message this morning is called Elu Appears. So a young man appears on the scene in chapter 32 named Elu. Or E-L-I, yeah, Elu will do, work with that, we'll go with that. His speeches go all the way through to chapter 37, which we're not looking at from chapter 32 to 37, we'll be picking out a few themes and things that happen in the book of Job. If you're wondering where the book of Job is, it's near Psalms, and go left. Yeah, so you'll be right. So Elu, son of Barakal, it's Job chapter 32, verses 6 to 8. The Buzzite said, I am young in years. And you are old. That is why I was fearful, not daring to tell you what I know. I thought age should speak to age, advanced years should teach wisdom. But it is the spirit in a person, the breath of the Almighty, that gives them understanding. We often think, oh, well, I did, that there's just Job and his friends and, and life's going on. But there's a number of people around them as he continues to do life. And Elu was one of these men. He was young and he was full of wisdom and he comes and he brings some insight. We learn something that neither Job nor his friends had discovered. Namely, that the suffering of the righteous is not a token of God's enmity, but of his love. Is not a punishment for their sins, but a refinement of their righteousness. The three friends have been wrong. Suffering is not the proof of wickedness. And Job has been wrong. His suffering was not the proof of God's wrath. God is not his enemy. God is not against him. And God is not against you or I. For he is for us. There's five things to consider today as we look at this young man, Elu. He comes and he, his speech comes and they present something new, a different angle, a different approach, godly wisdom. He thought he, he could just sit on the sidelines, but he was young. But no, he had to speak. Elhu is angry at Job because he justified himself rather than God. He was angry also at Job's three friends because they had found no answer, although they had declared that Job was wrong in his thinking. And there must be some secret sin in his life. Elhu disagrees with both sides of the argument. So Elihu has no intention to try to settle the matter the way the three friends did. We must listen to something new that takes us beyond this old argument. Who sinned and, and why is this happening? The second point 
to realise is that six chapters are devoted to his words, so he must have something important to say. It's more than just a continuation of bad thinking and wrong theology. And six chapters focus on his word. Chapter 32, 33, 34, 35, 36 and 37. His words point to something new and important that needs to be said. The third thing for us today. Job does not try to argue with him. He had been successful in silencing Elphaz and Bildad and Zophar, but he does not say one word against Elu, even though Elu challenges him in Job 33, verse 32. If you have something to say, answer me. Come on, Job, speak up. Surely you've got something to say. But he is silent. Because he agreed with his wisdom and his insight. It gave him some clarity. If we go to the end of Job in Job 42, 1 to 6, Job responds to the Lord with these words and with this clarity. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thought. You asked, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now and I will speak. I will question you and you shall answer me. My ears have heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and I come and repent in the dust and in the ashes. All that Job had journeyed through. He somehow knew in his soul that it was for his good and for God's glory. The fourth thing today, God responds to Elu. God does not rebuke him. Why not? Probably because Elu's words are not in the same vein as the words of those three friends. That his words are right and true and upright. In Job 42 verse 7, God looks back over this period of suffering and rebukes Job's three friends. Saying, after the Lord had said these things to Job, he said to Eliphaz the Temanite, I am angry with you and your two friends because you have spoken the, because you have not spoken the truth about me. As my servant Job has. Bellew's words are true. His words were right. And they prepare the way for God's final words in the closing of the book of Job. So, what hope does he offer? Insight number five. He comes and he offers a new understanding. LU gives to us a new insight. The suffering of the righteous. That Job and Job and his friends had not really perceived. And his insight does indeed make sense. The times the righteous suffer. That we as God's people will go through hard things and good things. The righteous and the righteous, unrighteous. There's no favoritism. But maybe God is wanting to do a work in you and a work in me. Job 33 verses 8 to 18. This is Elu speaking. But you have said in my hearing, I have heard these words. I am pure. I have done no wrong. I am clean and free from sin. Yet God has found fault with me. He considers me his enemy. 
He fastens my feet in shackles. He keeps close watch on all my paths. But I tell you, in this you are not right. For God is greater than any mortal. Why you complain to him that he responds to no one's words. For God does speak. Now one way, now another, though no one perceives it. In a dream, in a vision of the night. When deep sleep falls on people as they slumber in their beds, he may speak in their ears and terrify them with warnings to turn them from wrongdoing and keep them from pride. To persevere, to per, per, ah, good. To persevere them from the pit, their lives from perishing by the sword. Ah, must be time for a glass of water. Job's saying, where's God? And now you're saying, God comes and speaks. He guides and directs. He whispers. He gives us a vision. He shows us in a dream. He, he moves us from something that will harm us to something that will be good. If only we perceive what he's up to. If only we're willing to listen and be guided by his word. L.U.'s teaching is basically that affliction makes a righteous person sensitive to the remaining sinfulness and helps him to hate it and renounce it. Suffering opens the ears of the righteous. That's an interesting thing to ponder. An interesting thing for us to consider. That through pain and hardship, our ears are open more to God. He may be the only one left. And in our darkest day, we may only have God. We only may have His Word. Interesting. The psalmist has a similar thought in Psalm 119, verse 77. It was good for me that I was afflicted. Amen? Hands up. That I might learn of your statutes, or that I might learn of your wisdom, or that I might learn of your ways. I was hurting, but you didn't leave me, God. My hanky was soaked with tears, but God did not leave me. People may leave us, but God will not. There's a dimension of godliness that the righteous can only learn through affliction. So the new slant that Elu gives is that the suffering of the righteous is not a fire of pain and destruction, but a fire that comes and refines us and tunes our ears and eyes to the things of God that we may not have seen. Through pain we may get clearer clarity. Our heart may be broken, but God has not left us. Who loves KFC? A young boy and his dad was walking through the food court. They passed the KFC sign, and the young boy says, Hey, Dad, why is his body so little? <laughs> and the dad said that's not his body son that's his time now you can never unsee that can you <laughs> every time you see that slogan <laughs> that's not his body son that's his time well not anymore that's his body good old Colonel Sanders good old Church of Christ man you didn't know Elu describes a group of people whose ears are open in their affliction.
who experience deliverance because they've heard from God. They're not the godless, they're not the wicked, but they are the righteous that God brings clarity and hope to. They are people like Job who are upright and fear God and turn away from evil, who are blameless, who are faithful. They will suffer like you and me, but the divine purpose is not the same. Elihu advances our understanding beyond Job and his three friends. If we go back to the beginning of Job 32. He was angry because Job justified himself rather than God. And he was angry at Job's three friends because they found no answer, or they, although they had declared that Job was in the wrong. We must hold on to hope in spite of suffering. There's nothing else you hear today, hear that that we must hold on to hope in spite of our suffering. So in Job 36, 8 to 12, But if people are bound in chains, held fast by cords of affliction, he tells them what they have done, that they have sinned arrogantly. He makes them listen to correction and commands them to repent of their evil. If they obey and serve him, they will spend the rest of their days in prosperity and their years in contentment. Isn't that great? But if they do not listen, they will perish by the sword and die without knowledge. May we be people of hope and faith. May we be people of wisdom and knowledge. That in times of hardship, we don't lose sight of God and we wait for his word and we wait for his provision. As we hold on to hope in spite of suffering. May God bless you today. Our final week next Sunday. Amen.